This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Prajesh Amanath, and today my guest is Vidal Gropera. Vidal is an engineering manager at LinkedIn. He's the founder of Managers Club, an online site that helps share resources and experiences to inspire and help managers learn and improve. Vidal is the author of many books, including the Software Engineering Manager Interview Guide, Engineering Leadership Interviews, and Time Management for Engineering Managers. Vidal also maintains a mega list of one-on-one questions on GitHub, and this is how I first came to know about all the brilliant work Vidal is doing in this area. I'll make sure we have a link to this in the show notes. Vidal, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for having me on the show. Very glad, very happy to be here. Very happy to be here. We will be talking today about manager one-on-ones with their direct reports. We will cover the basics, understand what a one-on-one is, why it's important, what should an ideal one-on-one look like, how do you measure the effectiveness of one-on-ones, and the common challenges faced by both managers and directs in conducting one-on-ones. While preparing for this session, I also reached out to some of my friends and peers and have a list of challenges they have faced on the ground while doing one-on-ones. We will close the session by going through this list and see what suggestions Vidal may have for these scenarios. Before we deep dive into the one-on-ones, let's take a step back and look at meetings in general. What are the different types of meetings that one usually sees in the enterprises and how are they classified, Vidal? Well, there's lots of meetings. Of course, there's one-on-ones, there's staff meetings, all-hands meetings. If you're running Scrum, you might have a bunch of agile ceremonies like end of sprint demo meeting, retrospective meeting, sprint planning and grooming meetings. Those are very common in software engineering. Those are, they might be meetings to review, RFCs, technical documents, things like that. Right. So what is a one-on-one and how is it different from the other types of meetings? Well, a one-on-one is a very special meeting. I think it's actually one of the most important meetings a manager can have every week with his direct reports. And it's private. So that's one thing. You know, they're not recorded. They're not intended to be for other people. So I think that's one thing that's very different about them. And the purpose of the one-on-one A lot of it is to build connection, understand how people are doing, where the other meetings sometimes are very related to moving a project forward or communicating or downloading some kind of information. So these meetings are much more personal. Right. And what makes it important? What's the outcome that we're looking out from a one-on-one meeting? There are several things I'm looking for. One, especially nowadays in the realm of people working remote and hybrid, is to build a connection with the direct report. You know, I think it's important to build a connection with them, find out how they're doing, how are they feeling, how's their family, things like that. I think that's very important. Another goal would be to answer any questions that a direct report might have. Because, you know, sometimes people are afraid to ask questions in a group setting. So this is a good place for people to ask questions that maybe they're not comfortable asking in a group setting or just maybe personal to themselves, you know, like what are my possibilities of getting promoted or what do I need to do to get to the next level, which, you know, leads into career conversation. So a good part of the one-on-one can be about someone's career and career progression. And then a one-on-one is also very good way or place to give feedback because it's not really a best practice or it's not really good to give people feedback in public. So at a one-on-one, you can give people feedback confidentially. Understood. Let's move on to the next section where we'll deep dive into the one-on-ones and try to you know get into the really flesh it out. Okay. So let's start from the beginning. If you are a new line manager introducing one-on-ones in your team for the first time, how do you go about doing it? Well, I would tell everyone that I'm going to schedule one-on-ones with you. And so you can expect an invite. I would tell them my goal in it. My goal is to connect with you, check in with you, give you an opportunity to ask questions, give you feedback. So I would kind of set a little bit like why I'm doing it. 
I would let them know it's not optional. Like I actually made this mistake when I was starting out as a manager. I made one-on-ones optional for people. I would make it's not an optional meeting. If we can't, you know, like things happen and sometimes you can't have the meeting, but generally we'd want to have the meeting. So that'd be another thing I would tell them. So I would tell them and then I would schedule the meeting with them. And what I also do is see a lot of, well, almost no engineers are kind of trained in how to do a one-on-one. Few managers are. So there's actually some blog posts and some eBooks that I found that talk about how to do a one-on-one with your manager. So I also share these resources with my directs. Some of them read it, some don't. These are some ideas as to what they might ask or look for in a one-on-one. Right. You've touched on quite a few points that we will branch out and there will be questions on those that I'll come to later. But before that, can you tell me or walk me through a typical one-on-one? And is that a recommended structure for, you know, is that an agenda for the one-to-one? What should be the content of the one-to-one? Sure. I think the ideal structure has three parts. There's a part where we start with whatever questions the direct report has or whatever they want to talk about. So I usually start my one-on-ones after, you know, hello, how are you? Things like that. You know, I might check in, you know, how's your family? How are you doing? I might say, what do you want to talk about today? And so this is the point where, you know, my direct report can ask any question they have under the sun. And I'm very honest and transparent, usually to a fault. So they know they can ask me and, you know, unless there's some reason I can't tell them, I will just tell them and I'll try to answer whatever question they have because I don't want them to leave the meeting with unanswered questions. And if all we do in the meeting is answer their questions and things they want to talk about, that's okay. I think that's okay. Now, a best practice there is to have a sheet. Like it could be a Google Doc. I find Google Doc very convenient. And you write out things that you want to ask your manager or talk about. So when the manager says, hey, what do you want to talk about today? You're like, well, here's a couple things, you know, things that happened during the week. Maybe you write them down, some questions you have, some things you want to talk about. So that's really the first part of the meeting. Second part of the meeting would be, okay, is it okay if I give you some feedback? So this is where I, as the manager, If there's something I want to give them feedback about, whether it's good or bad, I'm going to share with them some feedback confidentially and see how that feedback lands. And thirdly, if there's time at the one-on-one, we'll talk about their career, career progression, how they're doing, how their performance is doing, so that there are no surprises later. Sometimes we don't get to that in the one-on-one, but I like to touch on that whenever I can. So that when we have a performance review discussion in the future, there are no surprises. So that's the ideal structure for me. There's three parts. All right. So to summarize the three parts of the first section is for answering any questions the direct might have. The second is for manager feedback. And the third one is talk about career and aspirations. Correct. I think that is the ideal formula. All right. And how long should a typical one-on-one be scheduled for? That's a good question. Uh, Typically, I do 30 minutes. Some people have one hour one-on-ones. I think it depends on what's going on. Maybe there's a lot of things. Maybe there's a lot of complicated projects. Maybe this is someone who manages a lot of people. So they're maybe not even asking just questions for themselves, but questions for their direct reports, or they need advice from their manager. So I think They go between 30 minutes to an hour normally. I think you have to, it's going to depend on what the relationship is and what is the job of your direct report. And so I think you just gauge it and you can adjust and say, okay, it looks like we're always running out of time. So maybe we need to make the one-on-one longer or, you know, we always have time left over. So then maybe we can make it a little shorter, but I think it should be no less than 30 minutes. Ideally, it should be every week. Now, sometimes you can't do that because of other scheduling constraints. So you could do every other week. But ideally, if you could, it would be every week for 30 minutes minimum. Right. And should there be any ground rules for 
in terms of time spent talking by the manager and by the direct because it's easy in such situations where the manager takes over the agenda and talks for majority of the time. Well, that's a great point. That is why I always like to start the one-on-one with what is on your mind? What would you like to talk about? So that way I try to clear anything that's on my direct report's mind before I start talking. Because yes, I as a manager could probably spend the whole 30 minutes to an hour, you know, either giving them feedback or talking about their career or, you know, other things. I'll say one other thing about the one-on-one. I should have mentioned this earlier. A one-on-one is not a one-on-one status meeting. This is a common mistake that I see. It's not a meeting to go, hey, what's going on with this project and why are you late or things like that. There are other meetings, stand-up meetings, for example, where you can get status of things. There's status reports people can send you. So the intention is not for it to be a one-on-one status meeting. And it's actually going to be very stressful because I know people, if that's the thing with their manager, then I know it's just stressful. Now, it's not to say, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, the relationship that the manager has with their direct report is a work relationship. So oftentimes we will end up talking about work, you know, and, you know, about the project and how do you feel the project is going and do you need any help with the project and things like that, which are definitely related to the work that they're doing, but it is not like a one-on-one status meeting, I would say. Right. And also you mentioned that ideally it should be every week. Yes. So the question is, you know, is there a point where, you know, if you do it more than once a week, does it mean you're overdoing it? Well, I don't really know very many people who do one-on-ones more than once a week. I don't think that's very common. I mean, if there was that much stuff to talk about, then you could do it. You can make a longer meeting. I will do one-on-ones twice a week with new hires. So if you're a new hire, for the first month or two, I will offer to do one-on-one with you twice a week just to have more touch points, just to make sure you're not lost or off track. But then after a month or two and, you know, you seem to be, have, you know, settled in, then I will go back to once a week. Right. And also in terms of the audience, right? I understand the one-on-ones you have with your direct reportees, but what are your thoughts in terms of having one-on-ones with your script team, that is the team members managed by your directs, if you have the time and bandwidth? I mean, skip level one-on-ones usually happen much less frequently. You know, maybe once a month, once a quarter, depending on how many, you know, skip levels you have or the, you know, the person has. I think in those, a lot of it is to, you know, check in with people, see how they're doing, answer questions, maybe give them some more context on things that are going on. It's not intended to be, again, a status meeting, and it's not intended to be a like, okay, tell me how your manager is doing. You know, it's not a thing to like, you know, kind of somehow evaluate how the manager is doing, you know? It's not for that. Okay. From a team member's perspective, what is the team member looking to get out of the one-on-one? Ah, that's a great question. So team member, there's lots of things a team member can do, right, to get out of it. One, like I said, get any questions answered. People always have questions, right? So you might have a question on a policy, you might have a question on the project. A great thing to ask is about priorities. There's always more things to do than there is time in the day. So a very legitimate question you can ask your manager is, hey, you know, I have this, this, and this to do. What do you think is the priority of them, right? I think that's a great thing to get out of a one-on-one. Understand about priorities. Understand about how your manager sees the value of the work that you're doing and the context to get information about how you're doing on your career and on your performance, you know? Am I performing to expectations? What can I do better? What could I do to exceed expectations? These are questions that you should be trying to get an answer to in your conversations with your manager so that you kind of know where you are, what you need to do, the importance of your work. You should also try to understand a little bit about your manager if you have time, like 
what are they, you know, what do they worry about? What are they thinking about? Is there anything you can do to help them or to help the team? That's always a very welcome thing when somebody comes and says, hey, I have this idea that could help the team. What do you think, you know? Or do you need help with a certain thing? Or how can I help you? These are all really good things that a direct report can bring up at a one-on-one and hope to get out of it. So I think they're very important meetings because as I tell people, your manager is the person who has a lot of influence over your career at the company, over your success. They directly, you know, they rate you, they write your performance review, they do all these things for you. And here is your opportunity in 30 minutes to, you know, basically make a good impression on them, right? To make a good impression, to find out how you're doing, what you can do to do better. This is a huge opportunity that if you are a direct report and go into a meeting and don't, you know, try to get some of these things, uh, I think you're really missing out. I mean, it's really bad when someone comes to a one-on-one and I'm like, hey, what do you want to talk about? And they're like, oh, nothing, nothing. I'm like, really? There's nothing on your mind? And then <laughs> nothing to share, nothing that they want to ask me. I think it's really a wasted opportunity. Got it. So carrying on on that same thought process, what can a direct do to make her one-on-one more effective? I would say keep a running document of things you want to talk about. Come prepared to the one-on-one. I usually, when I have a one-on-one with my manager or a skip level one-on-one, I will spend time. I might spend 30 minutes thinking about what do I want to ask? What do I want to say? What do I want to share with them? So I don't come into the meeting like, oh, you know, with nothing ready. So I think it's important to prepare, maybe spend some time, think about what you want to share with them. You know, maybe you have a couple ideas, you have these three ideas, what do you think of them? Which one do you like more? You know, things like that. I think that's really the best thing you can do is prepare ahead. Right. And from a manager's perspective, what are some good questions to ask your directs in one-on-one meetings? And are there any broad categories of topics that they should try to cover in the one two in the one-on-one? Well, as you pointed out in the intro, I actually have a GitHub repo with like many hundreds of one-on-one questions. If you run out of things to ask, you know, in the beginning, when I started as a manager, I had trouble coming up with things to ask people. So there's questions on all kinds of categories you can ask there. If you want to look at that list, things about what do you think we could do better in the team? You know, what do you think about the strategy of the company? Who do you work well with in the team? There's all kinds of questions. Is there anything I can do better to support you as your manager? There's probably like a couple hundred different questions there. I find that I don't need that as much now because... You know, I'm I'm able to be more in the flow with it, right? Like I'll start out with, I always start out with this question, you know, kind of what's on your mind? What would you like to talk about today? And once I build enough rapport and trust with my direct report, usually they'll open up and there will be things on their mind that they want to talk about. So we don't usually like run out of things. And then there's usually something I can give feedback on and We can always talk about career stuff. So when you become more, you know, when you have a better connection and rapport, I think it's easier. But at the beginning, when you don't, you know, you don't know the person very well, there are lists of questions you can use. Things to ask them about their family. Where did you grow up? Tell me about your background. What was it like to work at this other company? Why did you get into this field? Like just a lot of kind of interesting questions you can ask to kind of start the relationship. Right. And I'm assuming over time that relationship builds and you're more comfortable. Right. And then you need less scripted questions because you've kind of, you know, you kind of already know some things about them. So you can go, oh, you know, exactly, exactly. Are there any no-go areas that is questions that ideally or topics that ideally you would not cover in a one-on-one? Hmm. I'm trying to think, you know, I mean, things that you probably wouldn't cover, you wouldn't talk about at work anyway. You know, anything that's, I guess, kind of, you know, not safe for work, anything that would be 
inappropriate. I mean, you have to be very sensitive, right? You have to be, I mean, it's a work environment, right? So these are not like your, you know, your friends that you're out drinking with. So I would just keep it very professional. And there are certain things or jokes or stuff that I might talk with my friends about that I would not do it a one-on-one. Right. I think it's irrespective of the level of comfort, the thing that you need to remember is that it's a professional relationship and you need to keep the context in mind. Correct. Correct. So I think that'd be the biggest thing. But other than that, yeah, I was just talking about, you know, whatever. And, you know, we can still talk about TV shows. We can talk about sports, the weather. There's a lot of like personal topics, but just, you know, kind of keep it professional. You did touch on this briefly when we were talking about the frequency of one-on-ones but you know once you've got it scheduled the challenge is you have emergencies and fire drills and if something you know disrupts your calendar what's the preferred approach should you cancel the one-on-one or should you reschedule it i always try to reschedule it if possible so if something comes up and that happens a lot that happens a lot to managers because we live in the realm of meetings there's a meeting that comes up. I'll be like, hey, look, I'm sorry. Something has come up. Is it okay if we move our one-on-one or I need to reschedule it? Almost always people are okay with that. I actually know a couple managers who are really hardcore and they actually will decline a meeting if somebody schedules it on top of one of their one-on-ones mm-hmm. because they don't even want to move the meeting with the direct report because that kind of sends a message to your direct report that, hey, this other thing is more important than you. And they're like, no, you are the most important thing. So they won't even move the meeting, which is very strong. Like, I'm not so hardcore on that. I do think my direct reports are super important. But if it's possible to move the meeting by 30 minutes and then still talk with them and talk with someone else, then, you know, if that other meeting can't be moved, right? I'm assuming a conflict comes up that I don't have any control over. And it's right at that same time. And me and my direct report do have control over when we do the one-on-one. I will try to move the one one, you know, if I can, but I really don't want to cancel them. Canceling them is really bad. I had a very bad experience earlier in my career where I had a manager who would cancel the one on ones. And not only would they cancel them once, they would cancel them like right before the meeting. Okay. Like I would be like getting ready to meet my manager. Okay, great. I'm going to meet my manager today at, at three o'clock and you know, I want to talk to him about this. And and then it'd be like 2.58 and their assistant would go like, you know, I'm sorry, Vidal. So-and-so is not available. We have to cancel the meeting this week. I'd be like, wow, you know. And, you know, that can happen a few times, but that happened a lot. And it really sent me a message that I was not very important to my manager because they did this. They did it to other people too. It wasn't just me, but this was someone who really didn't value these meetings. So I would I would never cancel them like that. I will offer this though, that sometimes, you know, your direct report, for whatever reason, like maybe they're not in a good place. They don't want to talk. Something's up. I don't know what it is. So I'll let people, if they really, or, you know, they're really stressed out about work, I get stuff done. If they want to cancel the one-on-one themselves, because they have some reason, I'll let them do that once. They can do that maybe once a quarter or once a year. Like, you know, okay, you don't want to meet today. Something's happening. I don't know. You sure? Yeah, Vidal, I really, I can't meet today. Do you want to reschedule? No, my God. Okay, fine. We can skip this week. I'll give you your 30 minutes back. But I don't let people do that like more than once because if they want to cancel it again, then I'm like, wait a minute, why don't they want to talk with me? What's going on? You know? So that for me would be a red flag if someone wanted to cancel the one-on-one more than once. But one time, you know, things happen. So that's fine. Yeah. I was just wondering, you know, once you see that cancellation pop up, and if that's the second time that you've seen it, how do you approach that scenario? Do you you pick up the phone and ask him what's happening or... Absolutely. You're going to get a Slack message, a phone call, something from me. Because if you cancel it, then my first question is, what's wrong? Like something's wrong, you know, like what's going on? And I'm not even assuming it's something, you know, bad between us, but maybe something's really bad going on in their life. 
and I want to know that, and I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. But if it's not that they just don't want to talk to me for some reason, then I start to get really worried. So I'm definitely going to reach out to them and say, wait a minute, what's going on? Yep, got it. Any scenarios when a, when a one-on-one is not needed with your direct? I can't think of one. I think it is the most important meeting that you can have. It's like a manager's superpower, <laughs> a one-on-one meeting. You can get ahead of so many problems as a manager. This is what I've learned. You know, I can go to a stand-up. I can go to a status. I can go to a program review meeting. I can go to a meeting to review an RFC. I can go to a staff meeting. And people will say a lot of things. And I can leave the meeting going, oh, okay, this is what's going on. And then I go into one-on-one with someone. And they go, Vidal, let me tell you. Da-da-da-da-da-da. And I go, wow. There's some stuff going on I didn't know about, you know? So, and that also happen when you're having a one-on-one with like your manager, right? They might tell you stuff that it's not obvious, you know, in a bigger meeting is going on. So I would never skip them. No, I think they're very important. Right. You talked about how a direct should prepare for the one-to-one. Mm-hmm. From a similar perspective, how should a line manager prepare for the one-to-one? Okay. So you should kind of be up to date on what your direct report is doing, right? Like if you, I mean, you should be attending these meetings or looking at stuff. So you go into a meeting and this happened to me in the past, right? If you, to the extent you can, you should try to understand, know kind of already what is the status of their work, right? And what's going on. So, and that also prevents the need for this kind of one-on-one status meeting because you kind of know. I take notes. We didn't talk about this, but I always take notes at one-on-ones. And sometimes I'll take action items. You know, my direct report asks me or something, hey, I need a mentor, for example. That's a great one. You know, I need a mentor, can't find a mentor. I say, okay, I'll try to find you a mentor. Or I have a question about immigration, or I have a question, I need a point of contact and something. And I'll say, okay, I'm gonna go find the answer to your question or this person. So I'll I'll take action items sometimes. And then what I like to do is when I go to the next one-on-one, I have an answer for that. So if at all possible, what I do before the one-on-one is I review the action items that I took, if there are any. And so when I come to the meeting, I can be like, hey, you know, last time we talked about your need for this thing, and here's what I found out, or here's who you should talk to. Or here's the answer to your question. Like maybe they ask me a question, I don't know the answer. So like, I'm going to have to look it up. Let me get back to you next week. So I think that's what managers should be prepared to basically have done their homework. Because this kind of sends a bad signal, right? Or when one asks you something and then you're like, yeah, let me look into that. And then you didn't look into it. So mm-hmm. that's not good. Yes. And when you take the notes, do you share those notes with your direct? I don't. Because I take them in a, I have a notebook where I keep all my one-on-one notes all together. So it's not possible for me to share it because then you'd see the notes for all the other direct right. reports. So it's actually a physical notebook. I keep a physical notebook where I write them down. And so I found that is actually very useful. It's one of the few things that I do that's on paper anymore. You know, everything else we do is email and Google Docs and things like that. But one of the very few paper things I do is this paper notebook of one-on-one notes. Right. You talked about the three parts that should be covered in a one-on-one. How do you close the one-on-one? What's the ideal you know, way to ensure that you, know, you come out feeling better than how you went into the one-on-one for the direct? Well... I mean, I oftentimes I'll close with things like, is there anything else on your mind? Anything else you'd like to talk about? You know, again, kind of going back to point one, I, I don't want people to leave with unanswered questions or doubts. So that's one way I'll usually close them out. You know, I'll ask people too. Sometimes I will ask them, you know, sometimes you'll get a vibe, like when you're having a one-on-one with someone and, you know, it's not very juicy, right? There's not a lot of stuff to talk about. They don't have very many questions. You don't have a lot of things to give them feedback on. And so I will ask sometimes if I find myself in that situation where it's a little, I feel it maybe wasn't so valuable. I'll say like, how is this one-on-one for you? 
how can I make it more valuable for you? Is there anything we could have done differently? Because I don't want it to be a waste of time for them. That would be really bad. But, you know, it doesn't have to take the whole 30 minutes either. Like sometimes it's perfectly fine. You know, things are going well and there's not a lot of questions and there's not a lot of feedback to give. So you don't have to use the whole 30 minutes to one hour if you don't need it. Like, I think that's bad to kind of drag it out. But yeah, I'll just kind of check in with them. You know, how did it go? What do you think of the one-on-ones and things like that? Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think we covered a lot of ground over there. We'll move into the next section, which is around measurements. And I wanted to understand, you know, if if you are a manager, how do you gauge the effectiveness of your one-on-ones? So I will judge the effectiveness of them in... Like part of it is like kind of the quality of the conversation that I have with them, right? If I feel that we're having a good conversation and a good connection, then I think that kind of the immediate goal of the meeting is being met. So part of it is kind of subjective. Like how do I think the one-on-one is going? Like does it seem productive? Are they saying, you know, that was really good. You know, thanks for the feedback. Thanks for explaining that. Okay, now I understand, you know. If I'm getting signals that it's kind of working, but you know, one way to measure this too is we do, and like almost every company I've worked at does this, they do upward manager surveys. So there'll be like these 360 things where all the direct reports on your staff will be asked questions, you know, like how do you, you know, does my manager support me? Do I understand how my job ties into the mission of the company? You know, different questions, Mm -hmm. right? And if you're having really good one-on-ones and really good staff meetings and your directs are saying, yeah, my manager supports my career goals. Yes, my manager's on my side. Yes, my manager, blah, blah. All these questions about your your manager, if you're scoring high on those, then I would say the one-on-ones are effective because that's kind of the primary way that people are going to get the feeling that you are helping them on their side, trying to clear roadblocks, looking out for them, things like that. So those manager surveys are like an objective measure. And then for me, more subjective, just how is the meeting going? Or did they seem happy with it? Do they seem engaged, you know, in the meeting? Or are they kind of distant and not really, you know, happy <laughs> with the meeting? That would be the other part. Right. One of the challenges I've seen in manager surveys is that if you set a high bar for your team, or if a line manager sets a high bar for the team and really holds the team members to account, you usually notice those managers getting a lower score than some of the other managers who might be reluctant to give that tough message to their team members. And, you know, how do you differentiate that in these surveys? Well, it's not related to one-on-ones necessarily. I think that people want to do, they want to do challenging work, right? Like usually people, it's like a game, right? I'm trying to make an analogy to a video game, right? If the video game is too easy, then people will be bored and lose interest in the game. So if you're a manager and you make the job too easy, right? You have very low expectations. You don't expect a lot. The game is very easy. People are not going to be very engaged in the game, okay? I mean, maybe there's some lazy people that would like that, but generally people don't want that. Normally, you know, people want to learn and grow and they want interesting stuff. They don't want to be bored at work, right? So you can't make the game too easy. If you make the game impossibly hard, like the video game is so hard that, you know, you're dying all the time in the video game, you you can't make any progress, it's frustrating then people are not going to be very turned off by the game, right? So if you're a manager and you're putting too much pressure, you're making it very painful, you're stressing people out, they're also not going to be very happy. So you have to kind of find that space where it's challenging, interesting, engaging, but not so crazy hard that people are like, I hate this game, you know? Because after a point of time, they're just not going to want to play the game anymore. You know, they kind of go work somewhere else. Okay, got it. Moving on to the next section, which is around hybrid working. Wanted to understand if there is any difference in the way you conduct one-on-ones with your remote directs. Maybe, you know, even before we get into that question, should you be having one-on-ones with your remote directs? 
You should. You should have one-on-ones with everyone on your team. Well, let me talk about that, okay? I do one-on-ones with all my direct reports, even if they're contractors. I know that some people, you know, they treat contractors differently and you have to treat them differently. But as for one-on-ones, I still have one-on-ones with my contractors, right? Because I need them. I'm responsible. I need the work that they're doing. I mean, basically, you know, the, the team needs the work that they're doing, right? So since they're part of that work, I will meet with them. Now, I will also have, we didn't talk about this. We basically talked about one-on-ones with manager direct or, you know, direct to manager, but I will have peer one-on-ones. I'll have peer one-on-ones with other managers, project managers, TPMs, you know, any of these people who are like surrounding my team that we depend on to get our job done. I think you should have a one-on-one with them too. And I will also encourage my direct reports to have one-on-ones with people, you know, outside the team. So now let me go back. I think your question was, was it any difference between hybrid and before hybrid? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I think the one difference is that I spend more time in the hybrid world, basically checking in how you are, you know, how are your kids? How's your family? You know, if you have kids, maybe you don't have kids, but you know, how are your parents, you know, how a little more personal stuff I will try to check in on because see, when we're in the office, I could just go by your desk and I'd be like, Hey, how are you? How was your weekend? You know, like I could chit chat more with you, right? There was more chit chat opportunity. I could kind of see like how you're doing We're we're totally remote. There's less opportunity. So I will spend more time in the hybrid case doing that in person it wasn't as necessary because i kind of already knew some of those just by running into you in the hallway yeah and flipping it slightly are there different challenges if the manager is remote i think that not really i think you know you can man i mean it's manager can manage remote just like the direct can be remote the manager can be remote i think the only challenges happen when you have a situation where you have a bunch of people. This would happen before you have a bunch of people in the office and only one or two people remote, right? So then they can kind of feel that they're at a little bit of a disadvantage because, you know, they're not, you know, all going to lunch together every day or hanging out in the office. So it can create a little bit of inequity. But I think in, in today's environment, which is really interesting in COVID, when that hit, everybody had to go home right? So it was like a level playing field. So when it's a level playing field, I don't think there's any problems. When it's an unlevel playing field, I think there can be some challenges. So you have to be a little more intentional about it. But I mean, it totally works. I mean, there's people who are fantastic managers who are remote. Right. Excellent. We'll now move into the next section, which is around the pre-work that I did before this recording and trying to get some ground level challenges faced by managers as well as their directs. And I wanted to see what your thoughts are and any directional opinions that you could give for each of these. The first one is from a manager who says that my direct does not open up. He refuses to ask questions. So how do you get directs to open up in the one-on-one? I think you have to kind of demonstrate. You have to come from a place that you really, you know, you're trying to help them. It's non-threatening. You have to try to create a safe environment, right? Like if the direct doesn't trust you, right? If they think that you're there to interrogate them, right? And then one-on-one is not an interrogation meeting. It's not a, let me see what you're doing wrong meeting. You know, you have to create a safe space. You have to create, you know, this psychological safety. You have to really make it clear to them that, you know, I'm here to help you. And what you say here is confidential. That's another rule of one on ones you can talk about, but everything that's in one, you know, has to be confidential. You know, you can't be like sharing with other people. I mean, you have to kind of chip away at it. But yeah, some people are a lot more reserved. You know, some people really don't want to open up and it takes time. But I think, you know, as you try to understand them, what are their motivations? What are they interested in? Why are they working here? Why are they on the team? You know, are they there just for the money? Are they there for because they want to get promoted? You know, you try to just find out what their motivations are and talk to those and how you can help them meet their goals. I think you can get them to open up over time. 
but some personality types can be difficult. I agree. Thanks for that, Vidal. Moving on to the next one, and I find this quite interesting. So this again comes from a manager who is a people manager. And she basically says, what do you do if your manager does not remember anything from the previous one-on-one? And she has given more context. She says that she has fortnightly one-on-ones with her manager. She works in a metrics organization, so her direct line manager is different to a functional manager. In every one-on-one, she appraises her direct line manager about the initiatives and projects that she and her team are working on. But the manager does not seem to be interested because she has to re-explain the same thing in the next one-on-one. How can she correct this and make it a better relationship? Okay. You know, what I've done in my career, when I have these kind of maybe skip level meetings, I will ask my, you know, manager, skip level manager, like, what do you want to cover at this one-on-one? Do you want me to update you on these things? Do you want me to bring you suggestions? Do you want, like, I'll try to ask them, what do they want? And Because it seems like what you're describing is she's offering the manager some information and the manager doesn't seem interested in it. So clearly there's like a mismatch there. So I would go to them and say, you know, we're having these meetings and what would you like me to present to you? What do you want? Casey, what would you like out of it? And find out what this person wants because it sounds like they want something else than what she's providing. And hopefully that will help. Right. So have that conversation with the manager and understand his priorities and try to align the priorities so that the one-on-ones are more aligned with the priorities, I guess. Yeah, I think that's well said. It sounds like whatever information she's sharing isn't a high priority for that manager because they seem they're not interested in it, right? So clearly she's not on the same page with the priorities. So I would say like, what is important to you? What do you want me to bring or share with you that would be interesting? Or, you know, or just ask them, like, what, you know, a really good question would be like, if you have time, ask your manager, what are they working on? You know, okay, like we've talked about what I'm working on, but I'm just curious, like, what are you working on? What are the things going on at your level? And then maybe if she asked that question and found out maybe that manager is really stressing about something else, you might say, aha, then this is maybe what I could help with, you know? Yep. So very good suggestion. The next one is from a team member. And he says that uh, I'm a hands-on technologist with line manager responsibilities. So he's a manager with functional responsibilities as well. So he says with that with the weekly one-on-one meetings, I don't have enough time to focus on the actions that come out of the one-on-one. How do I address this? Should I reduce the frequency of my one-on-ones? Well, that's a tough situation because they're a manager, but they also have function, you know, they have to code or something right? They have to do this as well. I mean, it depends how big the team is, right? If the team is very small, you know, they're a manager. Like, you know, I had a team once that was very small, right? And also when I had my startup, which was, you know, at the beginning, very small, right? Then, yeah, I could code and I could also be the, you know, do one-on-ones. But as my team grew, I needed to kind of give up the hands-on coding part. And I think once you get a team that's like maybe five people or so, four or five people, there's probably like, it's kind of hard to keep the coding. So yeah, I don't know the size of their team. So if their team is very big, then I would say one, can you hand off the coding to other people so you can focus on the manager tasks? Now say you can't do that because you know, you're expected to code also. That's at some companies, that's the expectation. And you have too many direct reports Then probably your only choice would be to uh, reduce the one-on-ones to maybe every other week. And I mean, that probably be okay because if you are coding hands-on in the code base, you probably have lots of other opportunities to talk with your team, right? I think the scenarios that I'm talking about is, you know, the manager is not necessarily coding. The manager's not in all these operational kind of meetings with the team all the time. So the one-on-one is more useful to build connection. But if you're actually building along with the team, then you probably already have a good connection and kind of understanding what's going on. So... So it's, you know, it's probably fine to do every other week. Right. The next one is from a new line manager. And she asks, how long will it take for the awkwardness to go from one-on-one? Well, it's going to depend a lot on the people, right? Everyone is different. Some people are very open. Some people are not. There's also cultural things you need to consider because in some cultures, people 
deal with people in authority in different ways. You have to be sensitive to that. And so it can take quite a while. It depends on what is the delta between you and the report, right? Between your cultures, your personality, things like that. It might take quite a while to kind of bridge the gap that you can actually build a connection. Whereas if the person is very similar to you in background, then it'd probably be a lot faster. Okay, got it. The next one is a tough one. So here the line manager says, my direct has told me that she does not see value in the one-on-one and does not want to do it. How do you deal with this? And how do you deal with no-shows? You know, we have touched briefly on this in our previous conversation when you talked about making it, it's, it's not an optional meeting, but how do you convince the direct that there is value in the one-on-one? So, yeah, I don't know this manager. Maybe they're not, you know, we've talked about what I think the ideal one-on-one is, right? There's, you know, what do the direct want to talk about? Giving them feedback, talking about their career. I don't know if they're following that formula. I think if you follow that formula and you genuinely want to help your direct report, it should be valuable to them. But let's say you're offering that and your direct report still says, no, I'm not interested, right? And I have had people who you know, they don't want to do one-on-one. They're like, yeah, you know, I'm busy. I have to code. I have to work. I have to do these things, right? I have to explain to them, you know, your job is just not to code, right? Software engineering, I have a mentor, he always says that software engineering is a team sport, right? So, you know, I'm the coach of the team, right? You just can't play on the field and not talk to the coach, you know? It doesn't work that way. So it's not an optional meeting. I would tell you, you know, it's, it's definitely not an optional meeting. I want it to be valuable for you. Here's how I think it will be valuable for you. But if you don't think that's valuable, tell me, what do you think will be valuable? What do you want to do with the one-on-one? Then? Do you want to sit and, I don't know, code? Like, what is it that you want? Because I think everybody comes to a job, like, you know, have direct reports that are interested in all kinds of things, right? Some of them are interested in, you know, money, career advancement, a bunch of other things, right? They want to learn things. You need to find out what is this person interested in, right? And say, okay, how can I help you get that? So I would start with that, trying to understand, like, you know, explain to them, you know, it's like this concept, right? Whenever you want to get somebody to do something, right, you have to kind of explain to them what's in it for them, right? So I think with this direct report, there seems to, like, they don't get what's in it for them, right? So it's like, hey, what, this is what's in it for you and see what they respond and what is their answer to those questions. Yep, agreed. The other one is from our individual contributor. So he says that I have these one-on-ones with my manager. I go through my list and then I ask him, do you have anything for me? And he always says no. (laughs) What should I do? How do I educate my manager? Okay, this is very common. Okay, this is very common. And it's not great when you ask your manager, have any feedback for me and they don't have any, but here's how you can get some, okay? Because from a manager perspective, this is actually very hard. This is actually a harder question than it seems. Because you ask me, is there any feedback for me? Then I have to think back. Okay, well, what happened since the last one-on-one? You know, were there any incidents? Anything that was done? What might be the... It's actually a hard question because now I have to immediately scan my memory and try to think of something and it's hard. So here's what you should ask your manager instead. You should say, okay, I gave a presentation last Tuesday to the team on this topic. What did you think of it? How could I have done it better? You know, I sent out this document last week. Did you have a chance to look at it? And what do you think? So make it easier for your manager so they don't have to scan their memory if they have trouble, right? And this, some managers that can easily do this, but let's say if this manager clearly can't think of something. Go back over the past week and pick two or three things that you did and ask for specific feedback on those items. And then, you know, they should have some feedback. I'll say, hey, you know, how was my presentation on the team? So, and then they might say, well... I don't have any feedback on the, or you know, let's say they still try to dodge the question. Like, well, you know, it was fine. Okay, it's fine. Then you can say, okay, what should I have done for that presentation to have been amazing? Okay. This is actually a really good question I learned from someone because someone could say it was okay. You know, it was, yeah, this thing you did, it was fine. It was okay. But it's hard to dodge the question. What should I have done to just make it the best presentation you ever saw, you know, because now they have, you know, how do you not answer? Now you have to think of something, right? That they could have improved. 
right? What's the delta, right? What's the delta between this being fantastic and just okay? And you could ask that question. That's a very good suggestion. Thanks for that. The next one is from a manager who says that you usually have good and bad feedback that you need to convey back to your direct. How do you position it? Do you start with the positives and then move on to the negative? You know, that's kind of a classic question, right? You know, do you want me to tell the good news or the bad news first? (laughs) So you could say like that, you know, but even before I give feedback, I will ask them, can I give you some feedback on some things? And sometimes people don't want to get feedback. You'd be surprised. They might say, you know, I'm not in a place to hear it or, you know, I'm upset or whatever. Like, okay, you know, then I can give you the feedback later. So I'd first start, you know, I have some feedback for you. And you could say, you know, I have some good, some bad, you know, what would you like to hear first? You could, I mean, if they totally don't care, then I would probably give the constructive feedback first. And then to maybe end the meeting on a higher note, give the positive feedback afterwards. But you don't want to do is like confuse them though. You don't want to give like some positive feedback and then some negative feedback, and then some other positive. You don't want to sandwich like a negative feedback in between two positives because that'd be very confusing. So I would keep them very separate. Like here's the constructive feedback and here's the positive feedback. And you know, which order you do it, you know, up to you or you could ask them, but don't mix them because then it can be very confusing. Agreed. I'm not a big fan of the sandwich method. The last one from these questions is around a topic we have already touched, which is around taking notes. Over here, the person says, my company has a continuous performance system and the firm encourages conversations to be documented in the system. This, however, makes the one-to-one very formal and inhibits honest discussions. Are there any particular scenarios where documentation is recommended or should we just bypass and not document? Uh, the one-on-one conversations. I think it also touches on the confidentiality part that you touched on from a on the one-to-one. Yeah, that's interesting. I have not worked at any place where you are required to document the one-on-ones. You know, what I would do if I was in that situation myself is, okay, you have to document some of the one-on-ones, but how much detail do you have to put, right? You could say like, I don't know if this is okay, right? Again, I don't work there. Like, okay, we talked about this project and I gave some feedback to them, right? Do I have to say exactly what the feedback was? Or maybe I could, to keep it more confidential, right? Like I could maybe talk about the out, I could maybe write down the outline, but then, you know, verbally I could tell them stuff. Or again, I don't know if it's acceptable there to, to have certain things maybe off the record. Like, okay, like I might say, all right, let's just go off the record here for a minute. I'm not going to write this down, but tell me honestly, what do you think about whatever, you know? So maybe you could have that thing with your direct that you could, you know, maybe have a couple things off the record to keep, if they're very sensitive. But again, I don't know what the policy is. I've never encountered such a place where you'd need to document what is discussed in a one-on-one meeting. Yeah, I'm not sure here. And the person seems to be mentioning about performance systems. So maybe it's not about one-to-ones, but it's more about documenting the performance. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, or, you know, if you really want to do that, then I guess other suggestions I would have is you can have a separate meeting, right? You have the one-on-one that you document and then you have, I don't know, some other, you know, if you have a question, I don't know, just talk about it separately. Excellent. Cool. We'll move to the last section and we'll cover a lot of ground over here. So before we close off, What are some good learning resources for line managers to support them in conducting effective one-on-ones? Yeah, I learned a lot. I took this class. There's this company called like Manager Tools and Manager Tools has a course actually in running one-on-ones and it's covered in one of their books. There's a couple of books that talk about it. There's actually a book. I can send you a link from another company about how to have a one-on-one with your manager. They sell like a one-on-one software. I don't use the software, but I thought the book was interesting. That they wrote, you know, it was kind of an ebook to promote their product, had some best practices. I can drop you some links and then you can put them in the show notes if you want. So there are some resources on that. Sure. Thanks, Vidal. If you can send me the links, I'll make sure I add it to the show notes. Sure. Anything we missed or anything you want to mention? No, I, I think this has been really a great discussion. I hope this is helpful to people. I think one on ones are super, super important. I did not appreciate them fully at the beginning of my manager career. 
And now I can't say enough good things about them. So I'm happy to talk to people. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or anything if you want to talk more about them. Excellent. Vidal, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure. This is Brijesh Amanat for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.